you have a prepaid call from an inmate at State Prison, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using... Good morning, brother. Good morning. Okay. Um, so a lot of things I do, they're based around living differently, but at the same time, that's about finding purpose. What I'm looking, you know, what kind of support I would be looking for is for a commutation um, to, to appeal to the governor. It's really just where I can, where, places where I can give back, things that I can do, um, and really to build a larger outside organization, or just to build, to build something on the outside that benefits people out there. Um, that's kind of, I really focus on education. Um, this, is, this is this is kind of where my, my strengths are at various degrees and I run a literacy program. But uh, the, as far as as far as far uh, support and just, I'm kind of by myself in prison after 25 years. So sure, I'm looking for people out there that might be interested in talking to or getting to know someone who is just living living the life they have. And whether I get out or not, it doesn't really matter. I still have to live with purpose. So the, if, there, if there are people that are interested in contacting me, great. Uh, my major interests are uh, writing. Uh, I've got a published novel. Um, it's, and again, so, uh, I, I oversee a literacy support network at this institution, and that's about helping people learn to read. I found some purpose in teaching. Um, to help the people that are going to get out, regardless of whether I get out, uh, it's just something to do with my life. So that's that's kind of that's kind of where I am right now. Uh, I'm an executive body macro. Um, what do you go by? Uh, I go by Alex. What's your nationality? Um, my nationality is American. I'm a Caucasian American, white American. That's were you ever part of any gangs, groups, organizations, or an associate? No, I was not. Where are you from out here in the streets? Uh, San Diego, but Tennessee originally. What are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? I uh, was incarcerated for double murder, and my sentence is life without parole. The sentence was for one, uh, first degree murder and any other degree of murder. So it's the first and the second. And I had use of a deadly and dangerous weapon. And how long have you been incarcerated? Uh, 25 years. Okay. What, um, what, what, uh, what, because you look like you were like, you're educated, bro. You look like you, uh, you know, one of the type of people that I see in school when I was younger that, you know, hung around with, you know, maybe, um, you know what I mean, educated people and getting straight A's and stuff like that. Were you one of them people, bro? Yeah, I was. I did reasonably well in school. Um, I got accepted to a pretty good college. I went for a year, had some trouble there, and was kind of getting in a position to put, to put my life back together after that. Now, I didn't do well my freshman year, so I was just gonna, I was gonna be going to a junior college. But in high school, I was a varsity wrestler, and you know, I wasn't. Straight A, straight A, but I was pretty much all AP classes. Um, I was, uh, I was kind of what you, you would have looked at as kind of a normal kid. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was outside of the family. It was pretty straightforward. I looked and sounded and talked like just about everybody else in Del Mar. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I know it shocked a lot of people just because it seemed to come out of nowhere. Okay, without self-incrimination and incriminating others, because I don't know if you're going through any appeals or anything of that nature, um, can you take us back to the events that occurred and um, that landed you in prison? I'm in prison for killing my parents. That's something that's up over decades. Um, I'm not really sure that it's it's suitable to. It's kind of a it's kind of a unique circumstance in that respect. There there was a there was a very this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Um, and there were 
there were issues that we had that I really, they don't belong in the public view. And I made the worst choice possible one day because I couldn't see any other path forward. I felt personally threatened. And I just didn't have a grasp on on reality, on what on what the situation actually was. And in a moment I just gave in, let panic take over, and I killed them. It was a horrible, horrible thing. Thirty seconds after it, I knew just how horrible a thing I'd done. And my first instinct was to lie about it. So I wrecked a lot of people's lives by trying to convince them to support me. So I made what was bad much, much worse. My sense of life without isn't something that comes from a court. That's something that there's no, that's from knowing what I did from seeing what I did, from seeing it play out in my, in my, in my mind's eye. There's not a day I don't see it. That's life without. So, that's the reality of doing something that's just fundamentally wrong. It doesn't matter if there's reasons for it or if there's a logic behind it. It doesn't matter if there is it? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. It was just completely wrong. So that's something that I've come to understand. And so what I do in prison, I do because I'm not a liar anymore. And I do what I can where I'm found. That's... If I do what I, if I'm, if I'm ever let out of prison, I'll keep doing exactly the same thing. I'll just be found someplace else. That's, my situation is completely of my own making. And the impact that I had on people I cared about is, is terrible. And it's, it's shameful beyond words. So, here today, I try to find some purpose. Because the other option would be just to be bitter about who and what kind of a creature I am. So I do what I can where I am. Because I have nothing else left. Right, so one time you, you, you just snapped, right? So it can happen to anyone at this point, no matter, um, you know, I mean, how that person is or how calm and collect or how, you know, goofy that person might be or educated or, or things of that nature. You just snapped one day. Can you, like, like what, can, like, how did that happen? It's some, there were things that built up from, due to, there was a, there was a family problem. And it lasted from the time I was seven to the time I was 12. And it wasn't something we talked about. It wasn't something that was publicized. It was a problem. It couldn't go away. So I thought I could let it go. And I was relatively sure I could. But things in my life were steadily falling apart. And as much as I tried to put it back together and find a solution, there was no solution that made our family happy. There was nothing that made us whole and all right. And I was absolutely convinced that they, that they wanted me to be dead. Not to kill me, but it's just I needed to go away. And, to me, and I, in my head at the time, I felt completely threatened. I didn't know how to solve the problem. And one morning I woke up and it just occurred to me, and all day long, that there was no other path to end the problem. That there was, there was no, there was no fixing it. Because of how I grew up, I'd learned 
that when you can't fix something, sometimes it just has to be ended. Okay. I tried to hold on to that. I don't know. That's yeah. You know, it's, it's look. It's not. It's not a neat solution. It's not a neat. Hey, something bad happened. I did badly in college. I was afraid of disappointing my parents. None of that. It was a long, drawn-out problem that developed over a lot of years. It came from growing up in a first-strike target in in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where my dad was a weapons designer at Oak Ridge National Labs. I understood what it was to kill millions of people as a government-ordered solution and find that acceptable. That ending problems was acceptable. I had that in my head. And that's the only reason and I, that's the only reason I was able to, to do what I did. Is that I knew that if you have a problem that can't be fixed and you feel it's a threat to you, it has to be ended. And it was absolutely the worst thing I could have done. There's, I mean, there's nothing worse than I could have done, either then or, or any time since. So I, that's, I don't know how to, I don't know how else to put it. It's just too many little things that add up. It's just, and even in the, yeah, even in the kid, the lives that look normal, there's something wrong. Um, my best friend, his, his dad was beating his mom and beating their grandparents. And, yeah. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. These were the nice track homes. So, yeah, it's not survival. It's just, hey, here's a fucked up life. Um, it needs to look as normal as possible. And that's the reality. It's, it's not, you know, it's not simple. It's not straightforward. It's not just, I have to survive or get shot. It's, I have to maintain something even though it's a complete lie and be miserable all the time because everyone around me is miserable all the time. And that's just the way life is. That's, that was the situation at the time. I, don't know, I can't, I can't really explain it any better than that. Okay. When you, um, when you, when you first got sentenced, um, did yeah. you believe that you, you, you got a fair sentence and a fair trial? And also, when you first went to prison to hit the main line, what you, what was your mentality, considering that you know you you didn't like really live a life of crime or or, or gang bang or anything like that, and just be thrown in into a, a, a environment like that? So I would say I did not have a fair trial. I did have a fair sentence. I've never I've never had a. I mean, I, I get that. What I did, what the, I, the the trial itself was, it's ridiculous for other reasons. I watched the evidence get manufactured, but it's it's one of those things that I know they're manufacturing evidence because they can't prove something, but they know it's true. And I know it's true. So at the end of the day, it's I'm not mad about that. I've never been mad about the sentence. The trial, it's really, it's, it's unfortunate. It's really sad. It's not a justice system. Uh, it's that simple. I could go on a laundry list, but there's no point. It's, sentences are achieved. It doesn't matter how, what the path is to do it. In my case, it was the right thing to do. I was a dangerous person in that sense because I was, I acted in wildly wrong fashion. And as far as when it, when it was coming to prison, uh, I gotta be plain. Prison is simple by comparison. It's, you just pay attention to what's happening around you and you do the most violent thing possible. It's simple. It's really simple logic. If you have a problem, you solve it with violence and you move on to another yard. And it's it's not a puzzle. There's no there's no having to work with people you don't get along with that, that hate you, that are trying to actively ruin your path forward in your life. You don't have to smile at them. You just see, oh look, everybody's in these neat little groups. Go over and stand in that group. And when it's time to hurt somebody, all you have to do is hurt them. By comparison, no one in prison could matter to me the way that my parents did. And I knew if I had that capacity, there was nothing that there was nothing to be afraid of in here. I, I see I see I when I see what I did to them, there's nothing that can compare to that. It's one of the reasons I never got into drugs. <laughs> By comparison, 
medicine, they're a bad joke. Prison was never frightening. I remember my first riot. It was, oh, okay, here's a big guy. He's black, he has tattoos. And I just stuck some metal into him. Oh, and now he's going away very, very quickly. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's... <sighs> prison is not, I don't know. I, from where I came from, prison prison's really black and white. And I know that this is a fake little world. It gets, it's manufactured for people to live in. And I knew that going in, so I had that advantage. I never believed that this was reality. This is just how prison was. That was that was back in the back in the late nineties. It isn't I don't know. It's it's really it's really it's really hard to be scared when when the only thing that really should frighten the hell out of you even in a, in a concept you've already done. After that, everything else, so what? And if, if I got shot at some point, or if I got stabbed at some point, so what? It, it, at the time, it was really just waiting. It was just waiting for things to end. And stay nice and buried. And really, life without parole, that was a reprieve from having to face people in the rest of the world. I didn't have to deal with my family. I didn't have to deal with my friends, except for these tiny, little, tiny little visit windows, or the, you know, the, when you go out for a, go out for a visit for a, for a, you know five or six hours. That's all I have to deal with. I don't have to deal with the real consequences of my actions. And if I do something stupid in here, I always have. Well, I got life without. So I guess that'll excuse whatever harm I'm continuing to do. It took 17 years for me to figure out just how wildly shameful that is and just to be embarrassed about the life I lived prison is poor it's a fake little world so I don't know that was that was my attitude coming in I had an experience with extreme thinking and so it was very easy to take extreme solutions and because I was taking them more quickly than the people around me. I did just fine. It wasn't, there was nothing frightening. Um, I crossed over to SNY not because I was getting pushed over or anything like that. I did it because they said, well, life without, you can go to a level three. And it occurred to me that, you know what, if I started changing my direction, maybe there would be a way that I could breathe some free air. That's the only reason. Is I, yeah, I was on a 180 at the time. And I've steadily worked my way down to a level two. So that's, and I've tried, I've, I've tried living differently. And, it, and differently from, not from who I was as a kid. Who I was as a very small kid, that's exactly who I am now. Someone who believes, someone who has hope. That's uh, that's that's what I have. Okay, bro. Uh, what do you have to say to the uh, troubled youth out here that's involved in a uh, criminal activity? It's really easy to want what you don't have. It's really easy to just take it. It's really easy to just give in, be scared, and be a liar. Uh, that's not a, that's not something I will say. But, uh, when it comes to when it comes to being young, being a kid, and just doing what makes you feel good or feel safe or feel happy, there's no thought of consequences. There's just what you do right then and there. But there's consequences. And the thing is that even though it may not seem like it at the time, there's going to be another moment. There's going to be another day, and those consequences are going to be waiting. And it sucks because this is this is the life we get. That's it. When you make, when anybody makes choices that hurt others, that take away from the community they're in, it just it takes away from who you are. The things that I've done that are criminal in nature, it took
took away everything that I am. And that's that's the worst part is you don't even understand. It, it seems like it's what what you do to survive, but it's not. It seems like there should be some kind of hope out there that you can reach for and just take, and there's not. There's just a hard road in front, and that's all there is. It takes courage, and it takes strength to walk down it. And there's no guarantee of any kind of success. You have 60 seconds remaining. So, that's uh, that's what I can say. Is there, there, there is no, there's a long road and there's a longer one. And you'll have to walk down it. Um, walking down it with some pride, you can do that because you made the right choices. 